Philippians chapter one, let's, let's look. I want to think about the idea of how we celebrate the work of God, because I think some of us naturally are, are good at celebrating. You know, I mean, there's just some people who are joyful and can make any moment a party. You know those people. Some of you are those people. Like, you just, you just are so fun and cheerful, and you just, you just naturally celebrate things. Other people tend to just move on to the next thing and, and kind of forget that important celebration step. I am that second group of people. Like, I, I could finish something really big and exciting, and the next day be like anxious and just move on to want to move on to the next thing. When I graduated with my doctorate degree, okay, that's a, that's, I would consider that a relatively good accomplishment. I, when I, the day I got back from my doctoral graduation, I was Googling the next degree I wanted to get. And Pam was like, no, like we're done. Like that's, you, 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 you're, you're going to get caught off from your addiction here. No more school for a little while. And so like, I am not great at celebrating. I'm already like down to the next thing. I always want to go on to the next thing. And so celebrating is something that I have to be more intentional about, that many of us have to be more intentional about, whether it's good grades or or church things or family things, work things. Like pausing and celebrating and being joyful is, is not only something we should do as people, but it's something we must do as Christians. God has wired us to be celebration people. Like we are wired by God and being a follower of Jesus means that we are people who celebrate the work of God. Like we are people of praise, of celebration, of thanksgiving. That's, that's who we are in our DNA as Jesus followers. So we have to learn to celebrate. But, but what's weird about celebrating God, like as we celebrate our church this morning, one of the weird things we have is that it can get kind of cringy to thank God. You know, one of the cringy, I don't think we've ever done this. So if you've done this as a worship leader, I apologize. But one of the, one of the my pet peeve phrases is when a worship team finishes a song and they go, let's give God a hand clap of praise, okay? And uh, that might be meaningful, but to me, what I hear is you just want them to pray, put, you know, clap for your praise team while they change music. Like that's, to me, that is like the cringiest. And if you love that, that's fine. If we've done that, that's fine. But that to me is like, uh, are we clapping to God or the electric guitar player who just shredded that worship song? Like who are we clapping to in this moment? Um, is it the soloist, the guitar player, the drummer, whatever, is it, or is it God? One time there was a, a pastor who was doing a, he was guest preaching to a friend of mine, uh, one of my, he, was, he passed away, older pastor, mentor. Uh, his name was Ray Street Sr., and he had been pastoring for 50 years when I came on staff. And um, he said he once was guest preaching at a church, and an organist did a solo, which is like a, it's like a piano, but bigger, uh, if you don't know what an organ is. Um, but the organist did a solo during, like, the offering, like, a traditional church. And he went up to the soloist, and uh, afterwards it says, that was a beautiful solo. Thank you so much for playing. And she goes, it wasn't me. It was God. And you know what the pastor said? well, come on now, it wasn't that good. Like, it wasn't that good. Like, it was, it was still definitely a little bit you. Um, and so <laughs> celebrating God's work can get tricky because sometimes it's easy to start thinking yourself and not giving God glory. In fact, I think sometimes when we celebrate God, we can sound like this guy. I'm going to show you a quick video. I want to thank me. <laughs> I want to thank me for believing in me. I want to thank me for doing all this hard work. I want to thank me for having no days off. I want to thank me for, for never quitting. I want to thank me for always being a giver and trying to give more than I receive. I want to thank me for trying to do more right than wrong. I want to thank me for just being me at all times. <laughs> Sometimes, do you feel like sometimes celebration is like that a little bit? And by the way, I edited that video, but I was so afraid that I didn't edit it all the way. And so we need to learn to celebrate, right? You can, you can go to the next slide, because I don't think Snoop Dogg should be on any longer than possible in our... If you disagree? <laughs> Celebrating God regularly makes us not like that. We can give God glory... We can 
he's used us, right? Like, we're okay with that. He's used us. But we want to be people who, when, when there's thanksgiving going around, we recognize that we're instrument, instruments in a redeemer's hand, and he's done it all. So how do we celebrate what God is doing? Um, I want to look at Philippians chapter 1, because I think it helps us move from Snoop Dogg to worship and glorifying God for all that he has done. Let me read it to you. And then it's gonna, I'm gonna, there's three ways this, 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 uh, these verses help us to celebrate God. Here's what the verse says. I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you in every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. This passage that Paul preaches helps us understand how to celebrate each other, how to celebrate God from a posture of giving God glory, not about us, not about what we've done, but all about what he has done and who he is. And so we thank God, not ourselves. And so let's pray. And let's, let's, we only have a few minutes left, but let's walk through this passage as best we can. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the celebration. Thank you for the testimony. Help us to celebrate in a way that doesn't give us either false humility or, or even undersell the fact that we've worked and you've worked through us. But God, help us to celebrate in a way that gives you all the glory, not, not focused on us, not focused on who we are. We're, we're here celebrating seven years, God, because you have done something, not us. And so, God, help us to focus the glory on you, help us to thank you, and help us to celebrate well what you've done, not just in this church, but in our families, in our community, and what God was going to continue to do as we reach out into our neighborhoods. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this passage, I think, gives us three kind of clear ways to to frame our celebration of God in a way that is biblical and gives him glory. And here's the first one, that to be to focus on celebration God's way, we want to be deeply thankful for what God is doing. Thanksgiving is the key that links us from just being, moving on to the next thing, from being self-focused, self-driven, self-important. But when you can churn your thanksgiving from yourself to God, that can completely reshape the way you celebrate. You're always looking for ways to celebrate God. And there is no celebration of God if you lose a heart of thankfulness. So verse three, let me go back to the top of the passage. Paul is writing this book of Philippians. This is a letter he's writing to a church. And this is a largely positive church, but there's still some, some things in the letter that are, that are struggles and are being addressed. But he begins his letter as he begins most of his letters, pointing out ways that he is thankful for this church. And so he begins in verse three, He says, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you. Always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer. Paul is just saying that when he thinks about this church, he's in prison right now in Rome, and the church of Philippi is there in the the city of Philippi. And so as Paul is writing the correspondence during his prison time, he says that as I pray for you, I, in all of my remembrance, in every remembrance, I'm always praying with joy and I'm always praying with thankfulness. I thank God for you. And of course, Paul was in prison. He probably had a lot of time to pray. And so that is a big word when he says, I f- give thanks to God every time I remember you. That means that even in the troubles of this church, even in the struggles of this church, Paul is taking on a posture of thanksgiving for what God is going on. And we learn later on in this book, we're not going to go there, we don't have time to go there, but there was actually some disunity in this church. There was two ladies that were not getting along, and so he commends them to, he says, in the Lord, work it out. And so there were some issues that Paul was addressing. And Paul does this in so many of his letters, so many of the epistles that he wrote to churches. He thanks the church, and he thanks God for things that are in the church. But a lot of these churches had some serious things he had to get into. Like there was some sin and there were some struggles and there were pastoral issues that he had to yell at them for in these letters. He had to be corrective. But before he was corrective, before he got to this trouble, he spent some time 
in thanksgiving. And I think that's so key because Paul could have jumped right into the business that he had to deal with, but instead he paused and he took a posture of thanksgiving. I thank God for what he's doing in your church. I thank God for the gospel. I thank God for the fact that you're there in Corinth or you're there in Ephesus or, or Galatian, even though they were like drifting from the gospel. Like I thank God for at least Jesus and his gospel. Like Paul always paused to bring thanksgiving into this conversation. And that's a lesson to us for our celebration and for our lives. It is usually a whole lot easier to see the negative, to point out the wrong, to see what's broken, but it's a whole lot harder to see the grace of God at work. It's a whole lot easier to look at your life and go through a checklist of all the things that are bad or struggle or hard or not good enough or difficult. Like it's easy to see, you know, all the things that are wrong and just fixate on that. But what Paul does, even in some of the hardest of churches, he pulls out and he thanks the Lord for all, he zooms out, if you will, and he thanks the Lord for what he's doing. So for us, man, I want to be the kind of person that sees Thanksgiving in every situation. And in our church, the seven years, we celebrate what God has done, but there have been some hard things we've gone through. There's been some hard things you've gone through as an individual. There were days where, you know, COVID shut us down. We are days when the school's heat has been wishy-washy. There's days when um, there, this problem, this situation, this struggle, this circumstance, like we could go, we could go we could go through a lot of hardships we've overcome, but the posture I want is exactly what Paul says. I give thanks to my God in every remembrance of you, always in my prayer with joy. And so the first key for our prayer life and for our celebration of God to move from a thanking us mentality and thanking me mentality, a thanking God mentality, is to take on that posture of every situation is a chance to thank God. In fact, I would encourage you, let this be a test of your spiritual maturity. I have a, I met a lot of angry Twitter Christians who know a lot of information about the Bible, but have, but have little thanksgiving in their heart. If you can learn to be thankful in every situation, it's a great test of spiritual maturity. Can you see the joy? Can you find the joy? Can you be thankful? So the first way we celebrate God is by being thankful. The good, the bad, the hard, all the good we want, all the good we have is from God. So let's take on a posture of thanksgiving. The second thing is that we can be committed and celebrate the gospel partnership we have. Now notice verse five, and I'll have to explain this a little bit. Some of your translations might be different, but it says this. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, so Paul actually, I know that's just a phrase we're looking at, but one of the reasons Paul is thankful for this church and is celebrating this church and is thankful for what God is doing in this church is because of what he calls their gospel partnership from the first day until now. That word partnership, it also is translated as fellowship. Some of your Bible translations may say fellowship. He says, because of your fellowship, because of your partnership in the gospel. Now that word fellowship it's kind of muddied up in our modern view because we tend to think of the word fellowship as sharing in something. Like we had a fellowship dinner or we have a fellowship hall at a churches sometimes or we have a men's fellowship breakfast. We're gonna, we're, we're gonna talk and eat bacon together. Um, like that sounds fun, but that's how we think about fellowship. Uh, I, yeah, I'm gonna go, I don't have time for that story. Uh, we think about fellowship as like a sharing a meal or sharing a moment. But the Bible's vision of share fellowship is not sharing something, it's sharing in something. It's sharing in something, and that is more than the people, more than a moment. When the Bible uses the word partnership, it's not just going to lunch together, but it's actually your experience in Christ together. You're sharing in the gospel. You're sharing in the work of Jesus. And that is much bigger than a meal, much bigger than a fellowship hall, much bigger than a moment or even the people, but it transcends all of that. It means that together we have a fellowship because of and in the work of Jesus Christ. That's a much deeper level of partnership. And so when Paul says he's thankful for these people's partnership, he's saying, I'm thankful that Jesus has brought us together. Me a Jew, 
you, the church at Philippi, all the other churches from around the world. I'm thankful for your partnership, your mission together, our, our, our joy together, our lives together because of Jesus. And when you think about our church today, seven years today, what drives our fellowship? What drives our partnership? What drives us as a church? There are a lot of similarities we probably have, right? Like a lot of families, a lot of people in our church have young kids. A lot of people in our church, you obviously like my bad jokes because you keep coming back and forth. Like you live within driving distance. Like there are a lot of things that we have similarities in our church. And, and there, is a t- there is a sense that those things can unite us at a level But the gospel connection and partnership that we should have as a church is bigger than social commonalities and social bonds. We're not united by all of those things. What unites us is our spiritual connection through Jesus Christ. That no matter what nationality you are, no matter which way you vote, no matter where your neighborhood is, no matter how long you've been a Christian, no matter what age you are, what brings us together the deepest is our partnership in Jesus so when we celebrate, here's, here's what we do. We can highlight lots of cool things as a church. I mean, we've, we've set up, we've got a great worship team, we've got a cool kids ministry, we've got, we could celebrate this and that, but why not celebrate the fact that God has brought a people together that on paper doesn't make sense, but because of Jesus, we are a family. Like, that's a reason to celebrate our partnership in the gospel. And this is so counterintuitive to the world because the world, and I mean like outside of the church, the world, we live by divisions. Like the news wants to divide you. Politics wants to divide you. Like the world thrives on creating lines and division. How you vote, where you live, what you do with your free time, your education, your medicine, I don't know, whatever, whatever. Like you can find a division for everything. Do you like Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts, Chick-fil-A or Popeyes? We can fight and divide on anything. Android or Apple, ooh. Um, But you get the idea. The world wants to divide us on lines that are always changing. Every week it's something new to divide people. And that's what's counterintuitive about the gospel countercultural about the gospel because the gospel doesn't divide. It brings together people of every different background. Galatians, I don't have it in my notes, but Galatians 3 talks about how there's neither now Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free, but we're all one in Christ. How beautiful of that is that we can celebrate the fact that God is bringing people together and live that out in a way that shows and is a testimony to Jesus Christ. So we celebrate that together. Then the third point is I got to keep moving is that we need to be confident in God's continued work. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, and I think if you can adopt this verse, it'll change your life and it'll change how you view other people. Be confident in the continued work of God. Verse six, let me read it to you. He says, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus, until the day Jesus returns. Let me read that one more time and just just think of how this should impact how you view the future and how you view the future of other people in your life. Paul says, I am confident and sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. This uh, this teaches, it's one of the three verses in the Bible one of the three main verses in the Bible that clearly point to a doctrine known as either eternal security, perseverance of the saints, but it looks at how those who have responded to Christ in genuine faith, that God not only has saving power in that person, but he also brings a staying power in that person, that he will hold them, he will protect them, and that when you respond to your faith, you don't lose your salvation. You can't like... If you cheated on your fast or if you didn't read your Bible enough this year, you're out of salvation. That's not how salvation works, but the grace that saves you also sustains you. And so this this verse basically tells us that no one that God has brought into salvation of Jesus will be lost. And I use that word genuine. We can can talk about that. We don't have time to get into the nuances of that. But the truth is this. It it doesn't take a 30-hour fast for you not to realize that we are inherently weak. 
Like if you fast from social media, how many times did you grab your phone to go to scroll and like, whoops? Or if you, if you fasted from food, you walk by the fridge or you walk by the snack closet or your hunger pains. Like we lack perseverance. We lack discipline. And some may be more discipline than others, but all of us lack this at a level. You start your Bible reading for the new year in Genesis and by Leviticus, discipline is gone. You go to a small group. And I've been to so many small groups that will have like, 40 people there for the first time. And then like six months later, there are three of us going, hey, you're going to make it tonight? Like we lack perseverance. Healthy diets, studying for better grades, all these things. We are not people of deep perseverance. But God is not like us. God perseveres and God works. And he never starts what he does not intend to finish. And that is true for your life, for your family, and for this church. Like God has a plan and he's going to work it. In spite of your foolishness, in spite of, in spite of your insecurities, in spite of your struggles and your sin and your running from God, God has a plan and he will work it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. And so Paul can say in confidence, I am sure that the work that he started is going to be seen completed. Man, that just changes how you live. That changes how you view yourself. That changes how you view others. We tend to, we tend to view others through the lens of who they are now. Imagine if we learn to view others through the lens of what Christ could do in their lives. And the same thing's true to us, right? We tend to view ourselves and define ourselves by the now rather than the potential that God has in his kingdom work. And so that's what I want for you guys. That's what I want for our church, that God has started something and he will see it done. And that may look differently than in his sovereignty and in his plan. That may look differently than what we intended on it to be. I can tell you the, the plan for our church on paper that I submitted in 2015 for funding and for the North American Mission Board and all these sorts of things, it, it's, a, it's laughable how different it is today as we've flexed and moved and changed. And like, yeah, we might have dreamed to plant here, but that's about all that's been the same, okay? Um, God has moved and changed, but he's had a plan and he's working it to completion. And so we want to be optimistic about what God can do and seek after that. In your ups and downs, particularly your downs, God is working a plan in your life. Be confident, be hopeful, and trust that God and so a question for you guys is this. What is God still completing in you right now? Like if, if God is working to complete you and your life right now, what is, what is God working to complete? Like where is God still carving out the flesh? Philip mentioned this really well. He's still peeling, I don't hear you, he's peeling out the layers of onion, right? He's still peeling us and finding us. Like we're not done on this side of eternity. So where is God still moving you? to be a complete person. What has God already done that you can celebrate? That's a reason to celebrate, right? Look at where we've come and look at where we're going. We celebrate the work of God and his continued work in our lives. And so here's the deal. Celebration can be weird. Celebration can quickly turn to self-praise like Snoop Dogg. You didn't think you're gonna go to church and hear Snoop Dogg this morning. But my heart and our heart is to not be focused on us, not be thankful for us, not celebrate us, but pivot to celebrate God. And we do that by being thankful. We do that by realizing that only God could bring us together in his partnership through Jesus. And we do that by realizing that God is still at work and will continue to work. And so let's, let's make that our prayer for the next years of Connecting Church. Let's be even more thankful next year for what God is doing. And I, I really do believe that is, if we continue in the spirit of even our prayer meeting last night, continue in the unity we've seen through fasting and prayer, if we continue in that, only God knows what our church is going to look like in a year, what your life is going to look like in a year. And so that's all because of Jesus who sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. The reason we celebrate is because we were once not a people and now we are a people. Because Jesus Christ has saved us. Our sins are forgiven completely and fully in him. Our hope is completely rested in him. Jesus sent his son to die, live that perfect and sinless life. Jesus died on the cross so that your sins and my sins are not something we can even work out on our own, but we can turn to him and he's worked it out on the cross. He's forgiven us on the cross. And so the Bible tells us if you want to receive that salvation, I don't want to assume that everyone in this room knows that truth, 
We don't, we don't want to celebrate without knowing the gospel that the fact that we could not earn our salvation on our own, but Jesus died for us on the cross. Forgive our sins. We want to simply to, to own that and know that salvation. We just, we turn to God and we repent from our sins. Say, God, I'm sorry for all the things I've done outside of your hand. I'm sorry for trying to live on my own, be on my own, be, be self-focused on me and thankful just for me. But God, I, I confess my sins to you. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I need his forgiveness. I need my sins forgiven. I believe in him. And in that decision to repent from your sins and believe in Jesus Christ, we believe that you will be saved and you are free to walk a new life in Jesus Christ. He gives you a new life, not in your sin, but in his righteousness. And if you've never made that decision, we want to talk more about that. On your connecting card, there's a place that you can let us know if you want to know more about salvation and your relationship with God, or maybe if you need to be baptized and want to show others that you've made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, we'd love on your connecting card to fill that out and let us know how we can help you take those next spiritual steps. But let's celebrate what God is doing by thanking God, by praising God, and asking God. And so let me throw this last slide on the screen here, John. And uh, we, won't, we won't get a chance to do this long, but here's three prayers to take with you for this week before I close in prayer. Thank God for something he's done in your life. Praise God for the unity we have in Jesus. And then lastly, ask God to show you where he's still completing a work in you. And so let me close in prayer, and then let's eat some cupcakes.